Welcome to our Rabo Research Food and Ag Reports on Brownfield. I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner. With us is Don Close, Vice President of Food and Agribusiness Research for Animal Protein. Good morning. Good morning, Megan. Good to talk with you again. It's nice to speak with you uh, again as well. A recent report from Rabobank takes a closer look at beef production and exports um, as you see it over the next 10 years. And one of the things that I think we take from this is that it looks like there's going to be more production in the beef industry. So let's talk a little bit about that report and some of uh, the interesting uh, points from it. All right, and not only a, a lot of beef, but a lot of total protein combined. So we, we've, we're gonna be looking at a lot of meat. Uh, what we've done with uh, creating our own in-house baseline reports, it simply gives us the ability to, to, to take a longer term view with a founded uh, structure underneath the market. So as things change over time, you know, we can make adjustments. We know how the model was assembled and, and where we think we need to make tweaks when they're needed. What we came out of the report with is we still think that uh, total cattle uh, numbers are still expanding, uh, although at a substantially small, uh, slower pace than what we've seen for the last three years. Uh, you know, the Gen 1 uh, basically looking, uh, 17 basically looking at, at 31 and a half million cows, 31.7, and, and we expect to see that cow number build to 32 to 32 and a half million, probably see expansion continue through 2018, possibly into 2019 uh, with, to with total numbers. Now, one of, one of the real critical points of that report that I think a lot of people overlooked is while we're looking for additional expansion in cow numbers for another year to two years, but we're not expecting to see total peak in production until 2020, 2021. As we start to see some cow liquidation, we'll see that increase in tonnage. And just as we work the increased calf numbers or increased offspring from the additional cows make their way through the system uh, to get us to that uh, 2020, 2021 time window. So basically we're still, we should still be planning on several years of continued production growth here in the U.S. I think uh, absolutely true. And, uh, you know, we've had, we've had the, a, a frequent question of late with the impact we've had from the extensive fires throughout the West all season long, uh, the impact from the, the two hurricanes, has that really had a significant impact or has that changed our outlook of the market? And at this point in time, we're gonna say, no, it really hasn't. Uh, I'd say of, of, of the three occurrences, I think there's probably more potential for interruption in the production cycle from the fires in the West than, than from the hurricanes. Uh, worst case scenario, could that cause this whole production cycle to extend for an additional year? Sure, I'd give that possibility. But uh, to see a, a, a peak in the cycle earlier than we expected or a major disruption in total numbers, we're just not there. I have one question. You mentioned um, the fact that we're going to see a lot more meat in general. On the hog side of things, and I know we're gonna mm -hmm. talk a lot about beef today, but I, I think it's a little relevant. Um, we saw uh, some pressure in the fourth quarter of last year on prices as it related to uh, not having enough shackle space. Is that a sure. concern on the beef side of things as we see um, production increase that we're not going to have enough slaughter capacity? Huge concern. Um, and the, the situation with the, with the hog market, you know, we're, we're really in a unique situation where we have built hog supplies in preparation for the five new hog plants that are coming on, starting to come online now, um, opposed to the, the beef situation where we're expanding numbers, but other than a few tweaks and adjustments, we're really not seeing any motivation whatsoever to build any new beef plants. We could, we could see some expansion at some locations, I uh, would say some, some refiguration of uh, kill floors to try to speed up the, the lines a bit. But uh, 
it's a very real you know, we, we thought there was a risk of that as we approach this fall. Um, now that we're, we're to what should be our peak slaughter numbers right here, you know, within a matter of weeks, either side. <clears throat> but uh, I think we're okay for the remainder of this year, probably the first half of uh, 2018. But by, by the, the late summer fall of next year and certainly the, the late summer fall of 2019, could we get to a window of time uh, where there's just not availability to get cattle processed as timely as we would like? Absolutely a real threat. As we talk about all of this competition, uh, we look at more meat coming into the marketplace. Obviously, that puts some pressure on, on all prices, whether it's beef, pork, or, or chicken. On the beef side of things, are we surprised as we've seen maybe some prices fall back a, a little bit and some maybe a little bit more volatility in that market that we're not seeing, expecting the industry to contract anytime real soon? I think if, if we were to back up a ways, and, and we talked a little bit about the timeline we're working with, with expansion, where we think cow numbers will peak, uh, and, the, and the competition from other species. The piece that we overlooked with that, you know, we're looking at uh, ending stocks of, of corn for this year, roughly 2.4, 2.5 billion. Uh, all expectations are we're looking at a new crop that will be something just over 14 billion. Um, the, the bottom line of this whole thing, we're looking at at very, very ample to excess feed grain supplies for the next three to five years. The long-term scheme of things, the contraction in production uh, 2012 to 2014 in all species for different reasons, but, but a real catalyst in this whole expansion phase has been the low feed grain prices. And, and we're making the assumption that will continue to be the case for the next three to five years. Now, to, to go back to your question of what are the limitations in the marketplace, as, as we built the model, we didn't see limitations on availability of pasture ground. We didn't see you know, any limitations on feed as we've just talked about. But where we really see the, the limitations is we're looking at uh, at total per capita consumption of protein, uh, you know, in the 220, 220 pound area. We just think the domestic market is is a mature market, and and very close to what the maximum uh, per capita consumption can be. So that that's where where we run into a, a limit. You mentioned uh, lower input prices. How much mm -hmm. does that factor in right now as producers are looking at their bottom line and maybe even utilizing it um, long term for some risk management uh, strategies to protect margins uh, where they can? Um, from, from what I've seen, we've seen some very, very attractive uh, cash corn bids as we approach harvest, you know, hearing cash bids in the corn belt of, of sub three dollars. Um, with most of the producers that I'm talking with, I think the, I think everybody has has a, a nominal amount of feed uh, needs covered just because okay at these prices, why not? But I also see a real sense out there that hey I got I had plenty yesterday, I got plenty of corn today and I've got plenty of corn for the foreseeable future. So I think we could, at some point in time, and I, and I don't think we're there now, but I think that uh, cons attitudes towards having any real quantity of, of feed booked forward, uh, probably a, a laxed attitude out there. You mentioned um, domestic demand is mature, or, or we've, we've reached our our capacity or our, our mature in, in that area. Mm -hmm. So as we look at more beef coming to market and, and more beef coming in, what do we need to do? Let's talk a little bit about demand. Let's okay. touch first on, on domestic. Okay. Uh, what are some opportunities for producers or, or for the industry um, to maybe entice increasing domestic demand a little bit? 
Well, clearly, in in the overall, with this expansion phase we've talked about, and the and expecting to see modest growth in cow numbers for the next year, year and a half, two years. Um, what this growth curve has done, it is it has enabled beef to regain market share from the other species, uh, and so. You know, as, as you referenced uh, a couple of times in our conversation, domestic movement of beef has been exceptional uh, all year long. We Clearly, we've seen uh, some modest uh, declines in, in retail prices that, that has stimulated movement. Uh, if you take our uh, almost a full employment rate, you take the, you know, while it's not, uh, not robust, but very consistent uh, growth in the economy, uh, consumer opinions have been very strong, so both uh, both at home meals and and even we've seen some slowdown just the last couple of months in in restaurant traffic that a little bit of a warning sign, but but overall consumption of beef throughout the year has been very robust. So does that mean we need to turn to the global market and and getting U.S. beef? Um, Increasing demand for U.S. beef in international markets. Absolutely, um, and and really where we're where we're at with the the whole outcome of the work that we've done is as we, as we talked about, we think we're we're at or near what maximum capacity of, of total species will be in in the on our home market, but with this increased production. That leaves us one of two choices. That's going to we're going to increase exports and see the U.S. become a net exporter of beef. That's been a you know a goal and objective of the industry for as long as I can remember. Or the only other alternative is to lower average carcass weights. the The carcass weight issue is one that has probably generated more debate in-house as we worked on the report as, as any other component. And, and my position has been, if you go back, you know, into the early to mid 1950s through today, the increase in annual average carcass weights is, is just virtually linear. You know, we'll see a little bit of deviation year to year, but just consistently we've seen uh, cattle get bigger. Uh, the the counter argument is, is that Okay, if, if you strip the, pro, you know, production gets to a level where you strip the profitability out of the marketplace, uh, producers don't have any choice, but will be motivated to sell cattle earlier and at, at lighter weights to try to reduce tonnage in the market. So that's, that's probably one point of, con of contention that we have internally uh, with, with the outcome of the report. You know, the... Uh, on a carcass weight basis, and there's some different numbers, some different ways that that number is derived, but from, on a carcass weight basis, the U.S. has never exceeded 10% of production and exports on an annualized basis. Um, so far this year, we've been running about 10.7% uh, year to date. We have a lot of months we're running 11, 11.5% 11 of production exported. I think that's a mega win for the industry, uh, and I think one that that really should deserve a lot of attention. Um, we're seeing that that increase in exports. You know, we've had a phenomenal year with uh, volume of product going to Japan. Uh, we've had a phenomenal year, and we've now overtaken Australia as being the largest supplier to South Korea. Uh, trade volumes with Mexico have have been quite good, so. Our, our view of this increase in exports and the fact we're, we're on top of 10% is really being accomplished without the formalized trade with China. Um, we're, we're, like everybody else, we're extremely optimistic what the potential is with China. The, the real hesitation that we have, we think that that's going to be a slow market to develop. Uh, and we're talking like a, a three to five year timeline to really to see a, a, a volume of trade going to China, at least direct trade. Uh, we'll still we expect to see the gray channel trade that we've always had continue uh, 
unfazed. But so, so when we talk these increased export numbers, really the, the majority of our work was accomplished before that formal agreement uh, was, was formalized. So if we have a card up our sleeve and how do we think we will accomplish these escalated export levels, uh, it is still, still expecting China to come along in time. Uh, one other component of this whole export equation, you know, when it comes to exports, you really, you've got three real areas. You got North America, uh, Brazil, what products coming out of Argentina, and then Australia, New Zealand. Uh, one of the, one of the real benefits that we've had with the volume of sales we've had this year with Japan and South Korea is simply that Australia has has seen a very constrained slaughter rate to date because of the drought problem they've had for the, the last 18 months. Now, as and I, I was on the phone with Australia last night, they, they did have some very good rains of two to three inches across a good portion of Queensland just this past week that should buy them some time. Uh, but but the, the recovery in, in total cattle inventory and number in Australia is still, uh, very slow because because of drought conditions. So we've been the benefactor of, of their reduced supply of product. So that, that's one factor that we've had going on this year. Um, but the, the point that we, I wanted to get to is so much of the time when analysts talk about global trade or industry thinks about global trade, we talk about beef and total tonnage numbers and as basically a, a homogeneous product. And I think that's a, it's a real oversight from the industry and a mistake. If you look at the, the increase in the percentage of cattle that the U.S. has had over the last 10 years, we've seen a 20% increase in the number of carcasses grading choice or better. You know, we're week over week, we're running uh, between 75 and, and 80% of the carcasses choice or better. That's going to be a mega driver in this whole movement to increased exports that we see that Japan traditionally buys a very high quality product. We know that uh, South Korea buys a high quality product. And, and from what we know about China, the emergence of that middle class, what, how they use the product. I think if there's a, a pleasant surprise to come in the marketplace is that once we do see volume with China, they will be buying a much higher quality product than what's generally perceived. So does that mean we also need to not just evaluate um, exports in terms of volume, but we really need to look at that value segment as well as, as we put high quality U.S. beef on the market, the global marketplace? I think you're absolutely right. And, and when I talk about that, clearly if you take the distribution of numbers of the total U.S. cattle inventory of, you know, 93 to 93 and a half million, you've got a cattle inventory of 16 million head in Mexico and basically a 12 and a half million head inventory of cattle in Canada. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is I think the, the combination of the rebuilding of cattle numbers in North America, the, the timing of this improvement in beef quality across North America, and the opening of China and additional trade with Southeast Asia, I think it's just one of those ideal crossroads in time where the right culmination of factors are coming together to put North America in a very positive position for a number of years to come. Rod, it sounds like uh, we get to end on a little bit of a positive note as we're talking that, about the beef industry. To me, to me, that is the silver lining. It, absolutely. Anything else, Don? I, I think we pretty well covered it. All right. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. All right. See you. Good talking with you. I'm Megan Grebner on Brownfield.